Thank you for coming this evening. Uh, I just, my name's Mustafa. I just want to welcome you to iMaker. Some of you are familiar faces and some of you are new. Um, just before we begin, I just want to kind of give you a little intro for those of you who don't know. Uh, who we are, what we do, a little bit about you know, the background of uh, iMaker and what we can do for you. Um, so obviously you know, we're a 3D printing store and we sell all of the machines that you saw upstairs, all of the filaments and the materials. Um, we obviously also provide training and workshops like this for the public to come and sort of get involved and, and learn. Um, but we've got a couple of other things up our sleeve. So you may have seen My Mini Factory, which is uh, on big vinyls behind you and advertised all over the place. And that's our open platform for people like yourselves to <coughs> design models, upload them, share them with the community, and allow other people to download them and print them. Um, and people can also buy your models, um, and when they do, you get a portion of the profit, which is pretty cool. Um, and we've also just released something called My Mini Factory TV, which is pretty cool. You can watch our designers at work, and this actually is going to be streamed on My Mini Factory TV, so I urge you guys to go and check that out. Um, and also, I just want to let you guys know that it's, this is not really like a, a lecture sort of environment, it's a meetup. So if you've got questions, feel free to ask. and you know, have discussions with each other. I'm sure you've all got great ideas. Um, but without further ado, I'm just going to hand you over to uh, Martin Actors, who you've actually all come to, uh, to listen to speak. So I'm going to hand it over to Martin, and uh, yeah, hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Let me introduce, for those that don't know Internet of Things, a little bit of the basics. Internet of Things is new, it's hyped, everybody's talking about it, but what is it? You basically will be able to connect anything to the Internet and interact with it. That's a little bit what it says. So what you now see is the version 1.0. You buy a paddle, as uh, the gentleman over there is wearing, and like you can connect it uh, to things, smartwatches, uh, wearables. You can buy a scale for your house, and you can stand on it, and then there's a cool app that shows you the weight. You can have like Bluetooth enabled things, like a smart lock that you can like, from a push on, your, on a button, open or close, you can be on the other side of the world, if there's cloud involved and so on. That's internet 1.0. There's lots of things there. You have like smart lights, you have all these things talking to the cloud all, all day and so on. What actually is the problem is that most of those things, if you would have a, a, a switch here and a smart light there, you would click here and it might go to California to some cloud, come back and then say like go on there. So what will happen is that the moment that your Wi-Fi goes down, your light doesn't go on. or the other thing that can happen is since that has an IP address and that has an IP address, somebody in the NSA finds a nice way of like controlling it remotely, or even worse, a botnet finds a way to do it. It makes it go on 10,000 times a second, and that thing blows up, might provoke a fire, and that's like not the type of things that you want. So at Ubuntu, we are looking into like the next step. What can we do to make Internet of Things really interesting? Because that scale wasn't really interesting because I had to go to that app. That smart lock did something and that Fitbit or smartwatch or health tracker also does something. But what if I could make apps, just like mobile apps, but IoT apps? The type of apps that if I get up in the morning, I find that that smart lock on my fridge has locked my fridge until I actually stand on the scale, and if my weight is the same as yesterday, opens up all day. If I ate a little bit too much, it opens up for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Or until I run a little bit, and my Fitbit said, you got today's goal, and then it opens up again. That would be an example of an IoT app, okay? It might be a little bit cruel, so there might be other type of apps that you want to do. If you have children, for instance, there's this big bad thing called the internet, and they know normally more than you do. So you don't want your six-year-old to come and explain that that lady was doing something weird. You don't want to do that. But you also don't want uh, 
to go and say like that 16 year old, you cannot go on the big bad internet, you have to be protected. Because they go to the neighbors and go and see whatever they want to see. So parental control is all about helping you as a parent, not about being the NSA for your children. Like for a six year old, you might want to make an app that says, okay, you said we needed internet for your homework. You get 30 minutes a day of free internet. Of course, like everything blocked so that like there's no, no content that you shouldn't see. After those 30 minutes, it's only Wikipedia. You said you wanted it for your homework, it's only for your homework. If you're good, you get another 15 minutes. If you're bad, we can deduct time. That's parental control, an app that somebody could make for that child. But for a 16-year-old, you're not going to do that. You're going to say, this is the worldwide internet, there's bad things on there. You can use the internet, but we put some boundaries that like, if you cross them, we will be notified so I can have a conversation with you type of thing. You're still able to go and see that. By mistake, that can happen. If it happens three times in a night, let's have a conversation. So that's the type of apps that you could make for your Wi-Fi. Now you could also make like apps for your vacuum cleaner. Why would you have an app on your vacuum cleaner? What is that good for? Well, if you buy a vacuum cleaner that could talk to your alarm system, that vacuum cleaner could come out when you're not at home and not drive against your children when they are at home. And it wouldn't trigger the alarm. It would just negotiate like, hey, I'm in the living room. It's me type of conversation. So it's exactly this type of thing that can be enabled. And if you look at like smart hubs for your home, they can actually, with something that emits Bluetooth like that smartwatch, know exactly where you are in your home. So if you walk around in your home, you can basically be localized and you can have your lights go on and off and save on energy. But you could actually, if you have a next generation, not that one, but some that like also have your heartbeat, come home and your house would know you're stressed. And from your Google Calendar, it can find out over time that like every, every Tuesday, you meet your boss just before coming home and you're stressed. And it can like try to play this type of music put this type of temperature, and so on. And over time, it can learn that like, if you get home and an espresso capsule 3 smell comes to you, and the music is this type of music, and the temperature is that type of music, and all these other things, it relaxes you. So IoT can help people to change the way they interact. It can also be used the opposite way. Like, if Google already knew that you were going to get a divorce before you did, because your wife was, like, Googling divorce lawyers and go using Google Maps, IoT will be even worse. It will be able to warn your wife that you will be having an affair just because you're looking at that lady, your heartbeat goes up, her heartbeat goes up, and, like, whoa, chances of you needing a lawyer are high. I'm going to precision here an act. So it can be used very badly as well. Okay? So... What are we doing in Ubuntu? Uh, if you're not familiar with Ubuntu, it's an open source operating system. It uh, powers about 70% of the cloud, so everything that runs on Amazon. There's a couple of like small companies using it there. That's the reason why it's so popular, like the Uber, the Netflixes, and like a couple of those small guys that nobody knew who they were five years ago, and all of a sudden have taught the whole world how to run things on the cloud. So now the big Companies are also starting to use us for those type of things. So we took Ubuntu, we threw away everything that you really don't need, and made an Ubuntu core, very small, concise, that can uh, fit on these type of boards. And this is an actual revolution in the making. So if you heard about Arduino, those are very small things that like, are, are really good for one purpose thing and have very few resources. If you heard about Raspberry Pi, Latest Raspberry Pi is a supercomputer. This one is slightly more powerful. It's like, for, for the technically minded, it's a quad core 1.5 uh, gigahertz. It has a gigabyte of RAM. For the non technically minded, this is five times the type of power the first Google server was. 
$35 credit card size. Imagine this going into different type of equipment. It will basically go on volume towards like one to five dollars. So you could have this perfectly positioned in here, positioned into anything that like is around here that has enough resources. Why would you want to do that? Well, your mobile, when you bought an iPhone, and you bought an iPhone, they were the same when Apple shipped them. Five minutes later, you downloaded three apps, I downloaded three apps, and now it's your mobile and my mobile. Now it's going to be my stereo and your stereo. And basically, we are working, for instance, together with the robot community to put robot apps and robot stores there. Why would you want robot apps and robot stores? Well, there's this funny robots that can like dance to music. So if you hear something on the radio, you'd be able to buy the latest dance for that robot. That could be like one thing. But the real big thing is that there's also environmental robot boats. They get sent to the middle of the ocean. They have a bunch of sensors and they can do experiments. At the moment, you send those boats. They come back five days later. You get all the data off. You send them back again. It's like expensive to do. What if you put apps on there? You get a sort of like Uber system. You get like a robot boat that goes in the middle of the ocean. If it's connected to some satellite, you could like pay for five minutes or five hours of running your experimental app on there and getting access to all those 20 or, or 30 sensors. You get the data out of there, app gets removed, you don't pay anymore. So you, that same boat could do thousands of experiments in that same five day trip. Why do you want apps on 3D printers? Well, the current way the 3D printers come to life is you have five guys that say like, okay, I checked out all the 3D printers and all of them have this type of lack of feature. So let's make a Kickstarter campaign, build a new one that solves this problem. They probably are very good at adding that feature to the 3D printer, but then they have to do everything else. And they might not be good at firmware programming, or they might not be good at this, or they might not be good at that. At the end, the product that comes out is good for that feature, but the rest is like perhaps not ideal. How can that be different? Well, imagine that it has this type of board in there. Yes, there might be experts in making all the mechanics. There might be experts in making software for 3D printers. If you cut it right in half and you make it interconnectable with like something here that you can plug apps into, all of a sudden, these guys don't have to worry about this world anymore. I don't have to care about software. I just use a standardized board, I put a standardized operating system and some framework for 3D printers, exposes an API to go left, right, up, down, I'm done. I made the hardware. I can now ship this 3D printer and somebody else can put different things on top. Why would you want to put different things on top? Well, if this 3D printer is in my basement, having an app on there that tells me on my television that it's, it, it finished the printing, I can now go down and see it. Having an Uber type of app on there that allows, if I did an investment in it, to share that investment with others and get paid for others using my 3D printer will make it a lot cheaper. Having an iMaker app in there, when my 3D printer is running low on something or is needs servicing, could automatically have things coming to my home the three days before I actually need it. So I never will run out of any materials anymore and if it's about to be broken, I get the replacement parts in the mail already. So anybody can make like Twitter apps and anybody can make like any type of apps that would go on there. And if it has a USB port, you could have like different extensions, like a 3D scanner that could be put on there. You could have like something in your mobile that like you can start like making all these like 3D imaging of something, have an app, and it goes immediately to your printer. You get home, it's waiting for you. It's this type of things that app economies make possible, and this is exactly what we're working on, and would like to stimulate the whole community to, to make an open source thing. If you look at the robot guys, they make something called ROS, which is a robot open source 
platform, and I think for 3D printing, if that same thing gets made, it will be so much easier for everybody else to bring their innovations. And the moment there's a standardized APIs, you'll see that these type of boards for specific 3D printers will become very cheap. Because if the volumes go up, prices come down. If prices come down, more people can buy 3D printers. If more people buy 3D printers, prices go down again, again, and again, and again, and again. And at the end, 3D printers can be everywhere. So that's the power of, uh, of what we're working on. And we would like to have the whole community uh, take part. If you want to try it out, you go to ubuntu.com slash things from Internet of Things. You can get all the software there. You can put it on any of these dev boards that you buy for $25 uh, dollars, uh, uh, on, on Amazon or where, uh, wherever. And uh, happy to take any questions. Yes, Raspberry Pi 2, there is. Okay. Yes, yeah, so, so the, the problem with the original Raspberry Pis is they were built on a very old ARM infrastructure. And uh, now the latest one we worked together with, the, with their foundation, and now there's an image for it. Cool. I, that app idea is really interesting, but it just sounds like, theoretically, the problem that <coughs> comes to the end user will be so complicated and so diverse that I sort of struggle to see how a developer could produce, you know, let's say it's an app that controls your home the automation system. Mm -hmm. he's, he's thought of all the options that could tie into other systems. Someone will come along and say something ridiculous like, oh, when I eat five uh, oranges, I want my car to turn on. And, you, know, you know, something just no one's ever really thought of. And how would... I'm sort of struggling to think how would even standardized APIs, like someone will come up with something that's so out of the park that it's not capable to be done by the app. Is there going to be a state where are people looking into perhaps AIs that you can just explain it in a very human manner? I want my thing to do this, and then it will handle all the rest. Because just coding-wise, it sounds so complicated if it's not. Yes, well, first of all, your imagination is your limitation. Like, today I'm talking here about 3D printing and apps. A couple of weeks ago it was robots. Next week I'm in Barcelona talking to telecom guys about networking gear and putting apps on there, putting apps in mobile antennas and putting apps in lots of other things. Uh, afterwards I will be speaking to industrial guys that have pumps and everything like that. So. I don't think there's like a technical limitation of putting apps and, and, and the software that we developed is exactly like how do you package that code and make it run on this, on a robot, on the biggest cloud. We work together with Amazon, with Azure and with Google on making sure that it runs on their clouds. So like the packaging will be the same. Now about your orange type of thing, as a, a silly example. Well, the idea would be that like, if somebody expresses, like, what if somebody could make an app? I don't know enough about this. And there's a forum that goes like plus one, plus one, plus, plus one. And there's a million people saying, I would definitely want to have that app. Five days later, some developer will say, like, I'll make that app. Because the idea of what we're working on is having uh, an app store, and not one, but many types of app stores. You will have a robot app store, and you will have a 3D printer app store, and it's not a typical app store. It's like the app store that like everybody in the chain can get better off. The developer that makes the app for the 3D printer, but also the one that like made the 3D printer, as well as the one that like curates the store and is responsible for the framework that has abstracted 3D printers. Because we don't know anything about 3D printers. And if these guys would be helping us say there's a good app or there's a bad app, for them it's easy, for me it's hard. And tomorrow it's a robot and the, after, uh, the day after it's another app. So it's like we actually don't want to have an all-around app store that does everything. We want to be the ones that help others run this type of things. 
Man, I have a question. I was really interested in what you were saying about you've got a 3D printer in your basement. When I'm not using it, I could have an app that perhaps, say, someone in my network wants to print a job and it automatically kind of gets sent to my printer when it's not in use. Do you see this progressing in that way, that you'll have a network of printers and they'll work more efficiently in the way, you know? Yes. And that's, that's the way you see it sort of going. So well, uh, until the moment that everybody can buy a 3D printer, yeah. like it will be just like photocopying. They were expensive in, in the beginning, so yeah, you yeah. would go to a photocopying center. So if somebody pays for a printer and use it three hours a day, there's another 21 hours that it could be working for somebody sure. else. Yeah. And if he puts a price on it that's reasonable, people just might... So we might be buying them as a cooperative and not as individuals anymore, maybe in, in the beginning, mm. yes. <laughs> make it standardized, make it like a high volume type of business. Yeah. And they become so cheap that everybody will buy it. Interesting. No more questions? Uh, who would you say are the leaders in creating the Internet of Things infrastructure software wise? How can we sell them? Who are the leaders? Well, it all depends on how you look at the market of industrial. In, uh, in, it's Internet of Things or industrial Internet of Things? Internet of Things. So it all depends on where you look. So if you go like home, for instance, we are working with this like very small Australian company called Ninja Blocks. They, I would think, are the leaders in smart hubs. They have this smart hub already that like uh, has gesture controls. So you come over it and you can go like, okay, and then it says the, the icon of a blinds, and then you go like this, and your blinds go down. It already knows if you have this smartwatch where you are in the home, and it has sockets. So, it, they already did their second successful Kickstarter campaign in the beginning of last year. Their second. So they are the type of uh, early players in the home automation. If you look at like industrial GE type of companies, if you look in car, it's another one. If you look in like, there's no winner yet. It's all different standards, different groups, and there's just a head start for some people but there's no winners in most markets, it's still developing. And we, as an operating system, normally are an enabler of others. So we work together with like either 3D printer communities, robots, or, or like standard bodies like All Join, All Scene, and, and, and all, uh, Industrial Internet, and Eclipse, IoT, and so on. And we can enable all those frameworks, and developers can just pick the easiest. But it's too early to call winners, I would say. Or I came in a bit late. The actual process of creating these apps, it's, it's through the Ubuntu Linux software. It's basically, the way you create it is you take your executable code, you put it in a zip file type of thing, and you put a text file describing what we need to execute and a couple of like the name and so on and the version, and you put it in a store. That's the process. It's like very similar to how to you make a mobile app. Last week we launched Ubuntu Phone, and pretty soon it will be Snap enabled as well. So in 2015, you make the same way a mobile app as a tablet app, as a PC app, as a smart device app, for anything from your Wi-Fi, your robot, your whatever, to the biggest cloud. If you want to run Docker, you can also run it. How will these apps be uh, distributed? So, so we have like Snappy apps or Snaps are distributed over the Snap Store. You didn't think about that. <laughs> uh, so, so basically, there's not going to be one Ubuntu Snap Store, but you have white label possibilities. You even have OEM possibilities. So, if you are a big uh, player and have lots of customers, and you want to give your customer a branded experience. Imagine you are, let's say, Vodafone, and you work with like BMW, Mercedes, and whatever for connected cars. You'd be able to have like either Vodafone store or Vodafone can give a connected BMW and a Mercedes type of store, and you can have like an iMaker store or you can have a robot store or whatever, and you can either host it yourself or have us host it. 
So do you foresee that there will be a number of different stores promoted by different sort of players like Raspberry Pi or? So, so we are like, we're working to make those type of solutions super easy so that we don't have to reinvent all the time. The idea is that like you can reuse the repository of apps and limit the apps to whatever you want. If you are a big brand, you don't want any app to come on here. If this is your device, you want to create and say like only those five apps are allowed plus my own. If you are an open platform, you can have say like anything that runs on here can come. It's your decision. Like we're not, we don't want to be on purpose the one governing all the rules for all devices in all cases would be impossible. Like you can do that for a phone. Well, some try to do that for a phone, good or bad. But like we cannot do that for everything out there because this runs like anywhere where you can have a Linux in there. And we are on the positive side of Moore's law. This is going to go down, will become cheaper, and will be more powerful and use less energy. So today it's this big, next year it can be this big. So imagine where it can fit. <clears throat> imagine like five times the original Google server. Microserver revolution. In the event the uh, internet of things causes an accident in the home or something, where would liability fall? Very good question. Nobody wants to be the first company that kills through IoT. <laughs> Very good question. What's the hard part of making apps for, uh, for smart things? It's exactly that. Anybody can make malicious code or can make uh, dangerous or, or uh, just badly written code that can go wrong. Like, you don't want an in-flight plane to have a bug and somebody can go in there like, oh, switch off motor, what does this do? It's not what you want. So security is extremely, extremely important. What we are trying to do is exactly focus on that part that we control. So operating systems tend to have bugs from time to time. I don't know if you read like hard bleed or shell shock. Basically, those are two uh, bugs in an operating system that like anybody had, both Windows as, as, as all the Linux distributions, because everybody was using some open source thing that had a bug that nobody spotted. What happens? Well, we pushed the next day a fix for it, <laughs> so everything that was running Ubuntu was fixed the next day, but in your home, you probably now have a television, a Wi-Fi, some hi-fi type of equipment and something else, still has hard bleed because you didn't upgrade it. So if it's connected to the internet, it's in danger. We want to solve that type of things. We want to contain the application so that if it's like badly written code, it can only do so much. Uh, and then there's responsibility for those that like want to make a framework that come out of that containment. We will take care of like our part. If you then have like buy a product with a name, they take liability for that product type of thing and we give them support for the operating system. So in this chain, it's not clear yet exactly who you will kill if something goes wrong, but this possibilities that like that will will be a lot clearer in next months. Yes? Um, you already told us that you're working with companies like Audino or Raspberry Pi or maybe Texas Instruments or some, mm -hmm. something for your hardware, but have you heard of, I mean, you've spoken about making them cheaper and cheaper so that more of them can be distributed. Have you talked about, uh, as a company, have you talked about the fact that there will be a lot of waste and uh, there's been a recent Kickstarter project uh, for a modularized uh, cell phone, for example. Um, are you thinking of modularizing the hardware part of things? So what we actually want is creating a software-defined appliance in the sense that like at the moment you buy something from a factory and the moment it leaves the factory it's determined what it does. That creates a lot of waste. What we actually want is like, okay, this is a, a network area storage, like it stores all my movies. Well, if it is app enabled and it can do more than that, I can repurpose it for other things. When like, so, so we cannot solve everybody's problem, 
but we can allow that like you determine years after you buy something that you can repurpose it for something else that's our contribution cannot save the, the rest of the world unfortunately so do you see these apps as being uh, open source and available to everyone or do you see them as being private for software that people have to purchase or mix and in that kind of what you're talking about there in that general purpose computing so for my smart telly I could also use it as a hard drive as a hard drive but the fact is that Samsung don't want to let me do that yeah. so for that point it's a closed system and how do you see this interaction yeah, so, so <coughs> we will make sure that the closed solutions can have open source solution next to it so if you look at like networking for instance if you look at Wi-Fi you could have somebody creating an open source solution and you could still have Linksys and Belkin and others selling the closed. There's advantages to both. Like it's Apple versus Android type of solutions. Some things are just easier if somebody controls it and takes care of it and charges you a premium for that easiness. Other things like allow you to experiment, but if you break it, it's your problem. So it's like, answer both. You will have open source and you will have paid. What you'll see is that like, if the paid is no longer adding enough value, then the open source will win in that market. So it's pushing the, the low value things out of the market. So it's worked a bit like drivers in that sense that for a product that is now you know, no longer being sold and no longer supporting drivers, they may be a sort of cult following for it, so an open source movement may then pick up and then, you know, and modernize the drivers going forward for that kind of thing. It, yeah, I wouldn't, like, like, everybody when they talk about open source talks about, okay, it follows the market. It's no longer following the market. Like, lots of the open source companies open source something because adoption is the big problem. If you work for instance, with telecom companies, it takes you two years to go and sell and, and sign a contract with them. If you open source your solution, they basically, the R&D guys, just say, oh, let me try that. And they make something that convinces their manager, their director, their VP, the CTO, and by the time it gets to the purchase department, it's already halfway in production, so they better negotiate something for support because you cannot launch it without support. So it's like, it's not a bad solution. It's just a different way of doing things. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Don't want to be the first one to die from, uh, yeah. Um, so that was really interesting. And I'm already thinking of loads of different ideas, you know, ways in which we could use these kind of apps with our technology and 3D printing. So that's it's really exciting. I'm gonna ask you, pick your brains later about that. So um, I think we had some of the guys from C Camp who are going to come and uh, give a little talk. So uh, it's Rob. It's just coming around. So uh, yeah, we were uh, part of this 24-hour sort of hackathon thing at the uh, Google campus. I'm going to let you explain this. You can yeah. explain a lot better than me. Well, for those of you that don't know what a hackathon is, it's a, a very short competition where a bunch of people often you haven't met will come together, share ideas, pick their favourites, and just make them. And see if they can win some prizes. Uh, we entered one about the Internet of Things. It was called Seed Camp, or Seed Hack, sorry. The idea was then that whoever won would be able to go to Seed Camp and pitch to investors. Our idea was a simple one. Uh, hey, there's lots of smart equipment in the gym, except for free weights, which are literally dumb pieces of iron. And we thought, well, why are they? We went around and made a really simple prototype, it was an Arduino, it had an accelerometer on it, that was it. And that was enough to spawn a business. The Internet of Things can often be very simple like that. And hackathons often have a lot of problems. One of them is simply most of the people who go there don't know each other. So after the initial flurry of the hackathon, you're left with a team of people that don't know each other. They don't know their strengths and weaknesses, and you expect them to go and run a business together. Well, it doesn't work most of the time. I've won a few hackathons now, and one of the things I've heard from everybody that runs them is always the same, that you might have first, second, and third place. But most of the time, those teams cannot stick together. Because as soon as they leave the hackathon, they can be in different countries and different locales. 
it's very hard to work like that. And I mean, what I can tell you now is what we've done and what we've done after the hackathon. Our first port of call was to go on holiday, get to know each other and have some fun. We went to Sweden. It's pretty cheap. It was great. We drunk, we partied, and that was the best thing you can do. And then after that, you get to the real business of uh, finding good data, making business models, and trying to find all the people you want. And after you've done a decent model, you've got good quality data to put into it, so now you have a real business proposition. People. Who can you find, and who can you convince to get behind you, so that when you go to that investment, you've got a list of names that convince those high-profile investors that actually, hey, look how many other interesting people are behind this. I want to get involved. So now I find myself in the Internet of Things space after a, a weekend of hacking and having fun. And I, I think all I can say about the Internet of Things at the moment is to mirror and concise some of the points already made, which is to look at what robotics do, which is to imitate life. We have dumb fingers and clever brains, and the Internet of Things, in my opinion, should be you have your sensors, you have your actuators. They should be really stupid and do one thing and do it really well. And then at the heart of it, you have really clever devices like your phone or your computer, and they'll do the controlling. But at the moment, a lot of what we have is centralized and proprietary. You have a local area network of things at best, not an internet. You've got stuff where you need to download a proprietary app. I did some stuff from the Science Museum, and they told me that when a proprietary app was needed to interact with some of their exhibits, sort of interaction dropped by about 70%, which is huge. So for me, the biggest challenge is how do we make it so that any device works simply in your home, rather than all the complexities I will leave to the better people at Canonical and worry myself about auto configuration. So I've got my phone. I don't want to download a specific app for light bulbs and a specific app for my fridge, because then, well, one, they're not going to talk to each other, but also, I'm bloating my phone, I'm opening myself up to all sorts of security vulnerabilities because there's multiple places where I've got holes. Rather, if every device out there simply uses existing technology, use your Wi-Fi, it's out there. With new Wi-Fi technology, more and more things can connect, and it's tried and tested. You're not going to get hacked over your Wi-Fi because people have been doing it for 20 years. But if you use a new weird router that does one specific thing for Internet of Things, you might. Now, we all use the web, so why can't you just access the web page of a device? Well, you can, why can't your phone, and then just download the configuration? When you make a mobile app, you've got preset things like sliders, switches, everything you might expect. You can think of it as your checkboxes on the web. Well, you can do that. For me, the Internet of Things, and the future of it certainly, is about <laughs> making stuff automatically configure to your control. So your iPad on the wall or whatever, it finds a new thing and just downloads the icon from the device. You press the icon and out comes its menu. Sliders, switches and everything else you need to control it. The interfaces are already using technology we know. JSON, Ajax, other technologies that people have been using for so many years. We can do that and create really simple, scalable apps that run on existing technology everyone's comfortable with. I bet everyone in this room almost has made a little demo website. Even if it's just WordPress, you've done it. And that's how simple it can be. So yeah, for me it's, uh, let's head toward that, the internet of things that's not sort of proprietary. Seed Camp is in May in Berlin. At the moment, we have been building a business model. We're making a marketing pack, and we're trying to find as many people as possible that we can convince this is a good idea. So that when it comes to Seed Camp, ideally, I want them to say before I arrive there, "Here's your investment. Just turn up and be better." Um, yeah, really, for me, it's get the names behind you, get people interested, get support, because that distributed field of expertise can really make a difference. <coughs> If you look at all join, all join, not yet. Okay, you should. It, it's it's like an alliance that makes different devices talk to one another and like does some of the things <coughs> that you already said. Yeah. Like I don't think it does everything, but it might be a good start. Yeah, I'll talk to you later, Brian. <laughs> cool. Thank you, everybody. All right.
So, guys, that's our speakers. Now, you're all here. It's not, like I said, it's not really a lecture, so I want you guys to all talk to each other. And you raised some really good questions, and it sounds like people have got some good uh, thoughts. So, you know, help yourselves to some drinks and just kind of, you know, wander around, talk to people. Um, and if you have any questions, you know, just ask any one of us. Uh, so, thank you very much for coming. And, uh, yeah, cheers, guys. Thank you.